So the first thing to identify in this table that's a little bit complicated is that there's all of these things called moderators. Let's ignore them to start with because the whole sample really identifies all of the studies that were done on the health beliefs model. Across the top, you can see that it's got the main independent variables, the predictors, the things that we're hoping we can change. Things like perceived severity, perceived susceptibility, benefits, and barriers. If you look at the title to start with, you can see that it's talking first of all about correlations, then the percentage of variance explained, and then the 80% credibility intervals for the whole sample of studies with the various moderators. As I said, I'll talk about the moderators a little later on, but if we look at the first row of the table, across the top you can see it's identifying the correlations between the behaviour and these different types of beliefs. Over here on the left, you can see that severity has a correlation of 0.15. Using the norms that we talked about earlier, you'd say this is a pretty weak correlation. You can also have a look at the credibility interval. And because it does cross zero, and remember this is an 80% credibility interval and most of the time 95% is what we aim for, because it crosses zero, you'd say that this is not a significant predictor, that the perceived severity is not predicting someone's behavior in the long run. If we move across to perceived susceptibility, this is a very small correlation, 0.05. Again, because the credibility interval crosses zero, you'd say it's not significant. There's a chance that there's actually a negative association between perceived susceptibility and someone's behavior in the long run. If we keep moving across to perceived benefits, now if we look at the credibility interval, we can see that there's a significant link between perceived benefits and someone's likelihood to change a behavior. Because this is a correlation of 0.23, that's pretty close to what we would consider a moderate correlation, about 0.3. If we move over to perceived barriers, again, this is significant. The credibility interval does not cross zero, and it looks like there's a moderate relationship. If someone perceives that there aren't many barriers, they're more likely to engage in the behavior down the track. One important thing to notice when you look at these effect sizes is that they're what's called heterogeneous. Heterogeneity means that the effect size is different depending on the samples that you're looking at. This is important to note because it might give us some insight into the areas in which the health beliefs model applies and the areas in which it's not so helpful. To give you an idea of what these two terms mean, this is a heterogeneous group. You can see that these fruit aren't the same. You've got apples, oranges, bananas, pineapples, all sorts of different fruit. This, on the other hand, is what's called a homogeneous group. They're all exactly the same. One of the things that is important about this is that heterogeneity might mean that maybe the apples, for example, are effective and the bananas aren't. One of the ways that a meta-analysis deals with heterogeneity is to try to pair the apples with the apples, the oranges with the oranges, to see whether the apples are different to the oranges. Maybe by separating the fruit, you might be able to identify which is having the bigger effect size. The way Carpenter did this is he tried to separate the apples, which he considered kind of prevention-based behaviors, things like sunscreen or exercise, with treatment, things that were designed to stop an illness that the person already had. So if we come back to our table, we can have a look to see whether these heterogeneous effects from the whole sample were more homogeneous when we looked at prevention versus treatment. Were the effect sizes different when we looked at prevention versus treatment? If you look at perceived susceptibility and perceived seriousness, the effect sizes are pretty much the same, regardless of whether you're looking at a preventative behavior or a treating behavior. If you look at the perceived benefits, on the other hand, the effect sizes look considerably larger when we're looking at something that's about prevention than for treatment. Similarly, the barriers seem to have a bigger effect when we're looking at preventative behavior than a treatment behavior. Exercise is most likely to be considered a prevention for most people. When we talk about exercise, we're usually thinking about doing it to stop some sort of illness in the long run. Maybe if you're seeing an exercise physiologist, exercise can be used to treat a chronic illness that you already have. The interesting thing here is that for those people who are using something to treat an illness, it doesn't seem to matter as much about how beneficial it is or what the barriers are like. Maybe this is because they already know what the benefits are and they know what the barriers are because they've already got an illness, it doesn't seem to matter so much about the benefits or the barriers of that behavior. However, if you're trying to persuade someone to do something, to prevent something that may or may not happen, it does seem to be really important to identify what are the benefits of that behavior? What are the barriers? Carpenter also looked at another potential moderator, which was whether the behavior was related to medication adherence or not. 
Because none of us watching this are likely to necessarily be prescribing medication, it's not really that important for us in this particular stage. 